asthma, and my asthma presents itself as coughing, and coughing sometimes affects my voice. So no, I'm not contagious, that I know of, but this has gone on for 10 days now, and so I'm not gonna be pushing my voice, I didn't sing the first hymn, but welcome, welcome, welcome to one and all. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your life journey and faith journey, you are welcome here at UCC Second Congregational Church. For those who are joining us online, I am Reverend Barbara Hess. I am joined today by Karen Ducharme, our Director of Music, Linda Pierce, our Director of Faith Formation, Today, Kevin LeClaire is our liturgist, and if you would like to follow along, I urge you to stop the recording and look at the website. We have the bulletin listed on the website, and it's easier to follow along with what's being said if you have the bulletin in front of you. I hope that you can join us in person sometime soon. For everyone else, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Happy birthday, Catherine. And to everybody else, it's a happy unbirthday to all of you. Why is it your unbirthday, you ask? I'll tell you in a little bit. I've been reading a book, an interesting book, that Peg McLennan, where's Peg? There she is. That Peg McLennan has loaned me. She knows that I lived in Australia for a year and have a special attachment to it. Because of my interest in all things Down Under, she loaned me a book called Mutant Message Down Under by Marla Morgan that shares her recollections, recollections of a walkabout she took with the Aborigines in the outback. Morgan notes that it's a fictional account based on her real life experience. Many believe the book is more fiction than truth and that her recollections differ from the true world of the Aborigines. I don't know how much is truth, and I don't know how much is fiction, but I don't think it matters because either way, the spiritual messages that she shares are overwhelmingly positive with real connections to our faith. Just a quick side note, like so many other indigenous groups, the Aborigines have deep-rooted beliefs and customs shared by their experience and their environment. The outback, which I was actually lucky enough to experience, partly on camel, is flat, arid, hot, and desolate. But the Aborigines have survived in this land for over, get this, over 65,000 years, and are believed to be the oldest continuous living culture on Earth. They understand their environment, and they understand how to adapt to it. They're clever, ingenious, creative, and deeply spiritual people. So this morning, I'd like to share some of Morgan's insights with you all. These are thoughts she says were shared by her average original friends. Notice how much they make sense with our faith. Number one, there is a definite connection between our physical bodies the eternal part of our being, and our feelings and emotions. The feelings that we experience when completing an act, giving a meal to the homeless, caring for an animal, watering a dying plant, or listening to someone who needs to talk, are all actually ways to channel our feelings and emotions. Notice mine were all positive and not negative. Sometimes we, oh, number two, sorry, number two, Sometimes we only believe in what we see immediately in front of us. If we only allowed ourselves to let go, to open up, and to soar higher, we can see a view where a much bigger picture is taking place. Number three, sometimes it's necessary to shed our old skins. We're not the same as we were at seven, or at 37, or at 67. At times, we need to shed old habits, habits, opinions, ideas, and even companions. New things cannot come when there's no room. Five, 
oneness, which is their supreme creator, has no shape, size, or weight. Oneness is hence essence, creativity, purity, love, and unlimited, untouched energy. Divine oneness, I see it as our God, is a supreme, totally positive, loving power. And finally, happy birthday. We celebrate our birthdays, but we should also be celebrating and honor each other's and our own talents. Recognize our uniqueness and our contributions to this life. If we grow in our abilities over the course of a year, or a course of two years, or 10 years, we should celebrate that. In the book, the Aborigines' names were given at this time as a way of not acknowledging their unique talents and gifts. These included names like Great Stone Hunter, Spirit Woman, Secret Keeper, and Sewing Master. I'd like each of you now to take a moment. You all have a card, I hope. And take a moment, and a pencil. I want you to just take a moment and think about one of your special gifts, something that you can give to God's world. And give yourself a new name, a gift name. You don't have to use your Christian name on this, just your gift name, but think of something that you think you give to others. And give yourself a name related to that. Once you're done with that, when you're leaving, please put it in one of the baskets, and I'm going to do something with it after. Um, in closing, I'd like to share Marlon Morgan's comment following an unbirthday celebration that she had experienced. She simply said, thank you to the universe for such a remarkable day. And I would like to add, thank you, God, for that universe. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me into the call of worship. Jesus calls on to servant ministry. Pretense, disharmony, good have no place in discipleship. Serve God and receiving each person as though we were alone. Lord, help us in truly becoming your two disciples. Today's hymn will be at CH 495.
Please join me in the prayer of confession in the Lord's Prayer. Let us, uh, let us confess our sins to God and to one another. God, in patience and mercy, we come to you on the real service, but say to you, This day the Lord reaches out to you with healing love and compassion. Receive the blessings which God offers to you. Be healed and made whole. Be ready to serve. Amen. Please join me in this in this altar week. Psalm 54. This is a prayer of vindication. Save me, save me, O Lord, by in, by in your name, and vindicate me by, by your what might. For the for the insolent have have risen against me, and excuse me, everyone. My my my, my sight is very good lately. Um, apologize. Your, save me, O, o God, by your name and vindication for your might. Hear my prayer, O God, give me the words of my For the for the invalid have, have have risen again against me. The ruthless seek my life, they do not set God before them. In the faithfulness. <coughs> Leader, with the with the free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. <coughs> the New Testament reading is from James. 3, 13, 4 through 3, and 4, 4 to 8a. The passage me meshes beautifully with the gospel message this morning. We are grateful to receive the wisdom from God, but not but he is, but not as he is people or arrogant to the Lord's death. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life and your works are done, and your works are done in gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For there is envy and selfish ambition there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, with a trace of partial and hypocrisy, good hypocrisy. And the few fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by others who make the peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you 
Where do you, where do they come from? Do you not come from your cravings that are, that are at war within you? You want something to do, do not have it. So you commit murder and you covet something that cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts you do not have because you do not ask. You ask, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongfully in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your sinners and purify your heart, you double-minded. This is the word of God. Thank you, Kevin. The Gospel reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. And in this passage, we can almost see and hear the disciples arguing as to who is the greatest among them. This is where we get the saying that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Hear now the words of the Gospel writer of Mark. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what Jesus was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? He sat down and called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it on his, in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our God is still speaking, and we need to keep listening. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The disciples weren't all that different from we from we are from the way we are today. It looks like competitiveness has always existed. Today there are competitive careers such as sales or in the legal profession or in competitive sports. But aren't we all competitive in life? There are some who want to be known for having the bigger car, the bigger home, the nicest trips. In families, younger siblings jostle with older siblings. Just this week, Scott and I were talking about what it's like to be the youngest child. I'm the youngest of three children. Scott wasn't the youngest, but he had an older brother. I even see it with my own grandchildren. The youngest sometimes takes on the oldest. In spite of being two and a half years younger, it's in our nature. There was a TV show many years ago which featured two siblings squabbling. How many of you remember the Smothers Brothers? Mom always liked you best. For those who, of you who aren't familiar with the Smothers Brothers, they were brothers who were also entertainers. They played folk music and did comedy as part of their act. In the act, Dick Smothers seemed to be the smarter and more put together older brother. And Tommy was the younger brother who couldn't seem to do or say anything right. In reality, Tom was the older brother and the more, more business-minded of the two. In reality, their roles were reversed, but the mom always liked you best was successful 
because the, un the universal theme seemed to resonate with audiences throughout the country. It's a very human tendency to worry that someone else is receiving more attention or getting more things. We worry that someone else is getting special treatment. We're concerned with the fact that they're wrong and we're right. We want to be the greatest, and often we think that by being the greatest, others will be diminished or somehow shown to be inferior. There's a children's book, The Pain and the Great One. In the past, I've read the book, but I won't be reading it today. But in the book, the brother and sister view their positions in the family as if, as if it was some sort of contest or competition. In the book, the little brother is two years younger than his sister. She is envious that he gets more attention as the baby of the family. The little brother is envious of the big sister because she is able to be independent. One example is that the big sister is able to use the can opener. She uses the can opener to feed the cat. The big sister doesn't see that that's any big deal. It is sort of aggrieved that she has to feed the cat. But the little brother thinks that being able to use the can opener is awesome. Both the brother and sister complain when they have to play with one another or in close proximity. But when they have an opportunity to play apart, to play alone, each child gets bored. Many people view the world as a zero-sum game. The term zero-sum means that in order for one person to win, and I put win in quotes, all others must lose. Think of zero-sum as being like pie. If one person gets a bigger piece, there's less pie for everyone else. With this thought pattern, there's always a winner and always a loser. Jesus is telling us that if we are to be followers of Jesus, we can't view the world as a zero-sum game. Each and every one of us is a child of God. Each and every one of us is made in the image of God. In the past, when I've read this particular gospel passage, I've imagined that Jesus was out in front and the disciples were following him. This week, I urge you to think about it differently. Imagine for a moment that Jesus was in the back as they walked along. In this scenario, it's easy to picture the disciples literally pushing and shoving to be out in front. As they're literally pushing and shoving to be out in front, they're discussing which one among them is the greatest. That image actually makes more sense than the other one. When Jesus picked up the little child and put the child among them, Jesus was making a strong point. Children were the weakest and most vulnerable in that society, even worse than women. That has been the case throughout history. A few weeks ago, for the Labor Day weekend, I mentioned that uh, just a hundred years ago, children as young as four or five years old would be sent to work in the factories or in the coal mines. Back in the time of Jesus, it was even worse. During the first century, there was no one, no one in that society who was weaker or more vulnerable than a child. A child had absolutely no rights, and they were thought of being little more than a piece of property. 
when Jesus took the child in his arms and said to the disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, not me, but the one who sent me, he is in essence saying that we are called upon to lift up and love those who have been marginalized by our society. We are called upon to lift up and love those who have no rights, those who are viewed by society as being the least, the lost, and the marginalized. For when we welcome one such person in Jesus' name, we welcome that person in the name of God. Life is not a zero-sum game. And especially here in church, we do not operate in a zero-sum manner. We can lift up one another without losing the love God has for us. God doesn't have a limited amount of love. God has an infinite amount of love, and God wants us to share that love with one another. By sharing that love and our resources with one another, we are worshiping God. Let's sit for in silence for a few moments. During the silence, and I will look at my watch, and it will be one minute, and when there's one minute of silence, it seems like forever. But let's sit in silence for a few moments. During that silence, I hope that we can each think about how we view people in our family, how we view the people in our church, and how we view the people we meet day in and day out. Do we regard the love we've been given by God and the resources we've been given by God something to be kept to ourselves like a miser? And I remind you that the word miser is the same word, root word, that forms miserable. Do we choose to be like a miser with the love and resources we've been given by God, or do we choose to love the world extravagantly? As we sit in silence, let us focus on the title of this sermon. Amen.
give a shout out to the Holy Spirit. As I've told you many, many times before, Karen Ducharme, our director of music, receives the picture on the front of the bulletin, the gospel readings, and the name of my sermon. And that's it. She doesn't see my uh, sermon ahead of time. And yet, time after time after time after time, the music you choose is absolutely perfect. So thank you. And it is wonderful to have the choir back. Thank you. As I said, we now come to our time of joys and concerns. Uh, Seth has asked that we pray for victims of last week's terror attack in Lebanon and all of those affected. We pray for everyone in the Middle East. We pray for prayers of resiliency and strength for those dealing with issues of anxiety, depression, illness of unknown origin, and for those who are waiting, waiting, waiting for either a diagnosis or an appointment for a procedure. Prayers of calmness and peace for Jay's friend Costa, for Linda Vila's brother who was dealing with cancer. Prayers of healing for Jay Ducharme. You poor little, <laughs> your broken wing, your broken. My <laughs> broken heart. <laughs> God's punishing me. Uh, every time I laugh, I cough. So, prayers for Jacob Sharp, who's recovering from a fractured ankle, and prayers for Greg Harris and Angela Powell as well. Prayers of safety and wellness for the Haitian community in Springfield, Ohio. Prayers of discernment as we discuss ways to spend or invest the $100,000, which was left to the second church by Jimmy Baker. Prayers of sympathy and comfort for those who are grieving. And please pray for UCC Second Church. And I, I do believe that not only are people praying for UCC Second Church, but I also feel that people are praying for me because even though I've had this asthma for the last 10 days, I have felt a lightness I haven't felt for a while. So thank you. We pray for Dan Fisher and Brooke Atwood. We pray for the people of Ukraine, for Israel, and for Gaza. We pray for peace throughout the Middle East. We pray for people who are carrying heavy burdens of a private nature that haven't been sh shared with anyone. I ask that you pray for me this coming Saturday and pray for my family as we put to rest my son-in-law's father who was found deceased a few weeks ago. I will be leading the service, presiding over the service, and I will be being a pastor and a mother-in-law. And I ask for you to lift me up with your prayers. There are prayers for people in situations that haven't been shared publicly. I will open the pastoral prayer with a time of silence, not one minute, don't worry, but a time of silence when we can lift up the names of the people and situations we've listed, but also those that are weighing heavily on our hearts. So please be with me in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for being here with us as we worship you. We lift up the names of people and situations that we have listed and that we have still hidden deep within our heart right now in the silence that follows. God, how amazed we are at the solutions Jesus offers to his disciples when they question their importance to him and his kingdom. 
They want to know if they will receive the great rewards, if they will be recognized and praised for their accomplishments, or at least their efforts. We are still so much like those early disciples. We want you to know how hard we work. We want to be praised and recognized for our efforts and successes. And we want you to pass over our failures as though they were inconsequential. When Jesus was confronted with their fears and concerns, he responded that they should be ready for service rather than adulation. And then he placed a small child in their midst, a child with no guile, no pretense. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Help us to reach out to others, not with thought of importance or gain, but in love and compassion, truly caring for each one we meet. When we have done this, we will have truly given our hearts and our service to our Lord. Amen. The writer of Proverbs teaches that God's wisdom is present and active in our lives in this way. Quote, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Jesus lived this wisdom in his life and called his disciples to the same generosity. Let us give out of this same generous wisdom, a wisdom that seeks a presence and purpose in our lives on behalf of all. The, the ushers will now come upon us.
as found in the bulletin. You are the generous one, full of mercy and goodness for your creation. Send your wisdom with these gifts, that they may reach those who need your love and welcome. Bring about a harvest of goodness through these gifts, sown in peace. Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. As the choir is getting ready to position, you may be seated. In the insert in your bulletin, um, I put in the Bible tells me so. It's an old chestnut by Dale Evans. And the choir will sing it through once, and you're welcome to sing the second time or the first time. So it's a little happy send off. Thank you. Thank you. 